you, Rachel, dear John, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as many of you know, gastric neuroendocrine tumors are the most common primaries uh, in the neuroendocrine gastroenteropancreatic field. And this is actually very nicely shown by a study of Bruno Liederle, a surgeon from Vienna, together with all the pathologists in Austria, looking at all the uh, neuroendocrine pathologies they could gather over 12 months. And what you can see there, uh, is there no pointer here? But anyway, I tried to do it without a pointer. And what you can see here is when you look at the most common site up there, namely uh, for the stomach, you see that when you lump together the type 1, 2, and 3 uh, types of the gastric neuroendocrine tumors, you see that they uh, have uh, both a rather large percentage of um, benign uh, behavior, but also there's a small, smaller group of malignant behavior, as Guidorin, you already pointed out. So how does it translate into the clinical setting? And there we know that the type 1 tumors are the ones that are hardly metastatic and are actually the types that are being taken care of by the interventional endoscopist, as I will go to in the next couple of minutes. And then we have the type 2 tumors, which are really rare, extremely rare. And I can tell you also, by just having seen over the years more than 5,000 patients with neuroendocrine tumors, that uh, the patients with type 2 is a real exception, and we have seen in our center maybe a handful of these patients. And I think that, is, of course, comes down to the reports you see in the literature to the high selection uh, of these patients being analyzed by specific centers. And then the type 3 tumors are the ones which I would touch upon at the end of my talk. Now, Now, when you look into the stomach of this patient, and there are usually patients endoscoped for um, uh, reasons that are uh, rather vague, that patients have some epigastric uh, unspecific uh, problems, and then you go into endoscopy, and what you see in the type 1 tumor is the patient that has a chronic atrophic gastritis, and then you have multiple lesions in the corpus of the stomach, and not so much in the, at the entrance and the exit of the stomach. Similar picture, we, even with more polypus uh, lesions in the corpus of the stomach, you see the type 2 tumors. And then you have the solitary, often uh, ulcerated lesions in the stomach entrance or stomach uh, ent uh, exit in the type 3 tumors. Now, when we look at the type th uh, 1 tumor, we know, first of all, that they are the most common ones. They are often small and multiple and found in the fundus and mainly in the corpus. We have in these patients not only a chronic atrophic gastritis, but we have an autoimmune uh, gastritis, which I will come to um, in, a, in more detail in a second. And then, the, as Guido Rindi already pointed out, these tumors are well differentiated and are rarely uh, of higher G2 grade. The patients are also characterized clinically, and that's, of course, very important that we look for gastrin. And the gastrin in these patients is usually raised, and also, what comes with the chronic atrophic gastritis, these patients have anacidic uh, conditions in the stomach lumen. And as already pointed out, also these lesions are hardly, especially when they're smaller than one centimeter, uh, metastatic. Now, when we look, somehow I cannot forward this slide. When we look in the stomach in more detail, what we can see is that you have a loss in these uh, uh, chronic atrophic gastritis patients of the uh, faults in this complete stomach. And on top of it, you see, uh, as you can see on the right side, uh, these multiple lesions. Now, what, when you see this stomach uh, mucosa as an endoscopist, you have to be aware that these patients most likely may have also pernicious anemia. And that comes down to the fact that you have quite often uh, an increased uh, MCV. And also, as I just pointed out, also a uh, highly increased gastrin. But you cannot take gastrin uh, elevation as a 100% uh, uh, fact. There are a number of patients that have uh, gastrins that are uh, just two or threefold increased. But once you have a patient that has a gastrin level that is more than fivefold normal, then you can be pretty sure once you have also uh, uh, the loss of gastric faults that you're dealing with a patient with chronic atrophic gastritis. 
One thing, as I just mentioned, since you have an autoimmune process in this chronic atrophic gastritis, uh, that you have, aside from uh, pernicious anemia, quite often also an autoimmune constellation within the thyroid and also within the endocrine pancreas. And that's something you have to consider when you see these patients uh, with a possible comorbid uh, constellation. So what's actually the diagnostic algorithm of this patient? These patients are, as I just mentioned, haphazardly uh, often a gastroscope for other reasons in this patient. Then you find this flat uh, um, uh, mucosa without the gastric faults, and then you have to take, and I think that's very important for the pathologist, uh, take a lot of biopsies within the uh, complete stomach in order to uh, verify the uh, chronic atrophic gastritis and also verify these uh, glassy uh, lesions uh, you find uh, in the stomach. Aside from that, then you have to go into full laboratory testing, which means a full blood count, a vitamin B12, and then you look for the parietal cell and intrinsic factor antibodies. And you also have to look uh, for the thyroid function, as we quite often see Hashimoto's disease in these patients. As long as these lesions are smaller than one centimeter, you just can watch and observe these patients. But once they get bigger, I will come to that in a second. Now, with regards to With the uh, uh, type 2, we may more or less have, in terms of pathology, the same kind of uh, situation that is with the hypergastremia, you uh, develop ECL hyperplasia and eventually uh, via dysplasia of the ECL cell or the ECL omas. However, in the type 2 patients, when you have uh, an MEM1 constellation, the driving force is not the autoimmune process, but it's just the uh, genetic setup, mainly driven by menin, that drives uh, to, the, uh, to the hypergastrinemia and also leads to the ECL uh, proliferation. Now, what's the difference between type 1 and type 2 subtypes? Exactly, just actually one main difference, and that is in the case of type 1 uh, uh, gastric neuroendocrine tumors, you have an anacidic uh, gastric pH, whereas in the type 2, based on the fact that you have quite often in the MEN1 patient uh, gastrinoma, you have, of course, acidic pH. But aside from that, the, the appearance, the endoscopic appearance, as well as the proliferation of these tumors is rather similar. And also with regards to the prognosis of the patient, this is rather similar to type 1 rather than type 3, where, will I, where I come to in a second. Okay, next. So what it, it comes down to with regards to treatment is in type 1, as I just pointed out, in most patients, once they have a lesion or uh, lesions that are smaller than one centimeter, you do the endoscopic mucosal resection. And only when you cannot uh, achieve a complete resection of these larger lesions by endoscopic means, then you may have in very, very few cases the need for a local resection or even antrectomy or hardly a total gastrectomy. Now, can I have the next slide? And here, I just want to show you briefly uh, regarding the uh, results of uh, endoscopic mucosal resection versus endoscopic submucosal dissection. And you can see that actually the results of the complete resection of the small tumors, being it type 1 or type 2, is rather high. And there's, uh, in most cases, actually uh, already enough done just using this kind of um, uh, procedure. It is uh, the endoscopic mucosal resection. Next slide, please. So once you have, uh, for some reasons, no uh, me means to resect these tumors by endoscopic means, then you can also use somatostatin analogs. And uh, there are some nice studies showing actually in the um, mucosa by um, pathological means that by treating patients with octreotide over a longer time, you see a reduction of the ECL number. And on top of it, also you see a reduction of the polyps in these patients treated with uh, somatostatin analogs. The problem, however, being once you stop the treatment, you get also a recurrence of these patients. Can I have the next slide? So let's just come at the end to the type 3 tumors. And here we deal, of course, with tumors that are, in most cases, already advanced. They grow invasive. 
and they are in a large uh, proportion already metastatic. And these are the tumors that are highly proliferative and found uh, at the more in the uh, region of the fundus as well as the antrum. And these patients uh, have to be treated according uh, to uh, means of an adenocarcinoma of the stomach. Next slide, please. So for gastric uh, neuroendocrine tumors type 3, it means we are going to have to uh, resect these tumors only once they're small and T1, and in all the other cases, uh, surgical uh, treatment by total gastrectomy is the therapy of choice. Regarding, of course, the systemic medical treatments, next slide, we have no data just for these small uh, primaries of the stomach in a G3 constellation, and the consideration there and recommendation also by European New Endocrine Tumor Societies that one follows the regimen as established for other primaries of NEC and NET G3, that is one uses platinum-based regimens or can also use temosolomide in combination with capecitabine or in patients that are positive by somatostatin receptor scintigraphy. These are the patients that can be also treated by PRRT. Next slide. So in summary, we have three different types in the clinical setting. That is, we have two types that are characterized by high serum gastrin levels, and these are the ones that can be clearly separated from the sporadic aggressive type 3 tumors. The metastatic rate is the highest in type 3 and the least in type 1. And the therapy is, uh, if one wants to use a medical therapy, uh, can be used, uh, can be somatostatin analogs. And there are also some reports that the gastrin receptor blocker netazepide can be also uh, effective in reducing the tumor volume. And with regards to resection, type 1 and type 2 are reserved for, for endoscopic interventional means, whereas type 3 are the ones that are left for the surgeon. Next slide. So in summary, with regards to the follow-up now, I think cl clearly with type 1 and type 2 tumors, we have to control these patients in yearly intervals by endoscopy. And uh, serologically, we look for gastrin and to a lesser extent for chromogranin A. Next slide. With regards to the recurrence of type 1 tumors, there's a nice study just recently published showing that you have a high number of recurrence. However, next slide, if you look at the survival of these patients, you see that they have a very long survival over many years, and the two errors indicate patients that uh, died not of a neuroendocrine tumor, but died of, in one case, hepatocellular carcinoma or myocardial infarction. So in general, we can say that type 1 tumors are the ones that are reserved for endoscopic intervention and should not be subjected, next slide, to uh, a surgical means. So in summary, I think, and I want to remind you that, that gastric neuroendocrine tumors are increasingly diagnosed. That is also based on the fact that endoscopists are more aware of them. And uh, finally, I think what is very important that these tumors, regardless what type they are, they have to be judged with regards to treatment by a multidisciplinary team. And as a last slide, I just want to show you one patient that was eminence-based, next slide, treated for a neuroendocrine tumor type 1 with uh, multiple lesions smaller than one centimeter, and the surgeon decided to go for a gastrectomy. And the result you can see in this case who went through a number of complications for no reason. Thank you for your attention.